This is Mises Weekends with your host, Jeff Dice. We're not far out from the US election next Tuesday, and Donald Trump seems to be coming back from the dead, with even people like Michael Moore supporting him. What's the latest betting with six days to go on who's going to win the election? It's very interesting. We talk endlessly about this and we get endless polls about this, which are increasingly, it's important to note that polling is increasingly an inexact science. Uh, The proliferation of uh, mobile phones has really forever changed the way polling is conducted. So we don't have households in the same way we had households in 1980. Uh, And most pollsters are still operating in that same mode. So I question polls. But the other thing to understand is that the Electoral College is really a unique mechanism. Only the United States has anything like it. So national polling is pretty meaningless. The the only numbers I really look at are the states that – I look at the states that Mitt Romney won in 2012. And I figure out, well, can – Donald Trump hold all those states and thus win those electoral college votes, but also win about an additional 70 electoral college votes. And that would require him to first and foremost win Florida, absolutely. Uh, But it would also require him to probably win some combination of Ohio, Pennsylvania, maybe Wisconsin, Virginia, which is very unlikely because Hillary's running mate, Tim Kaine, is a Virginian. Um, He'd have to hold Utah, which Mitt Romney won handily, but the Mormon church has issued a bit of a fatwa against uh, (laughs) Trump. Uh, So if you just look at the hard, cold math, even with these most recent uh, developments regarding Hillary's email trail, it's still very, very difficult. Nobody should underestimate how much of an upset it would be for Trump. And it would be an equal upset if they'd run a more garden variety vanilla Republican. Uh, frankly, I think he's Trump's probably doing better than a Ted Cruz or, or, or a Mitt Romney would do. But uh, it, it's, it's a very steep uphill battle for Trump. Uh, what we're more interested in is whether there's going to be some sort of contested result, that there's going to be um, abnormalities in a state like Florida in the voting machines, because none of us really understand how these voting machines work and are reported. You'd have to go state by state, and there's contractors, vendors involved in the electronic machines themselves. So it's it, it could be very fascinating. We could end up with one of those weird Twilight Zone uh, Wednesday mornings where – it's not clear who won and no one's conceded. And there's the possibility of litigation and lawyers are gearing up on both sides. And that's what we had in 2000, which was kind of a surreal period in America. I like it. I like the idea of not having elected anybody. Uh, I'd be perfectly comfortable with leading, leaving the position vacant uh, going into the next year. But uh, boy, if you stuck a gun to my head, uh, even today, I'd probably say Hillary wins. Now, we've seen that actually on Google Trends as well. We've seen lots of people trying to reverse their early votes. Now, I'm assuming that that's trying to reverse their votes for Hillary. Now, we're not going to have uh, hanging chads and uh, we're going to have hanging XML messages. But could she already actually have won with all this huge kind of early voting? Yeah, early voting is a very strange thing, especially in the new Internet age, because there seems to be a new scandal every day, a new WikiLeaks dump every day, a new revelation uh, so some people are voting up to, I think, more than a month ahead of time voting absentee. And that's that's a long time. Um, so who, who knows? She has huge advantages. Uh, her The deep blue states are blue and they're blue for good. Uh, some of the deep red states are getting less red every year. They're getting more and more purple. And it won't be long before states like Texas are in play. Uh, once Once Democrats... Uh, control Florida, Texas, New York, and California. Uh, Republicans won't win any more national elections. We can talk all we want about uh, we. I shouldn't say we. I'm not a Republican. But Republicans can talk all they want about outreach to Hispanics or uh, millennials, whatever they want to do. But the simple demographics are against them. And very soon, they're going to become a minority party at the national level anyway. Well, it's always been said, hasn't it, that democracy is a kind of long-term form of communism, which gradually gives you the socialist state, whether you uh, want it or not. Now, I'm going to ask you the $64,000 question then. Uh, It does seem to be a race between the undead of Frankenstein and Dracula. Are you actually going to vote in this? And if you are, who are you going to vote for? Or are you going to take a more kind of pure Hoppian or George Carlin position of not voting? I'm not going to vote. I don't view voting as evil 
or ill libertarian necessarily. I think it's morally and, and otherwise valid to vote if you believe it's in your interest to do so. If you're voting strategically as a libertarian, if you are voting defensively uh, and viewing as a matter of self-defense. And I certainly think on state and local issues, council issues in the UK, things closer to you, uh, there can often be a tactical reason for voting. If some new tax is going to be imposed on you and your town is small enough that your vote or you and your friends and families vote might make a difference, why not? And I think Murray Rothbard uh, talked about this in the context of of uh, slaves uh, being able to choose between a, a, a kinder or a crueler master. Uh, you know. So I'm not one of these people who denigrates voting per se, or says, oh my gosh, any voting is complicity with the system and you should never do it and, and you're just part of the problem if you vote. Yeah, you know, I'm not sure I agree with that. And uh, if people think that voting for Donald Trump is somehow going to uh, create a, a, an opening for uh, at least in a few areas, a, a slightly more libertarian policy, uh, you know, knock themselves out. But personally, what it comes down to for me is at some point, the United States is going to continue to to be involved militarily around the world. So at some point after the new president takes office, there's going to be bombings and killings and collateral damage of civilians. And, and that's where I personally struggle because even if I saw Trump as someone who's throwing a hand grenade into Washington, D.C., something I want to do, um, boy, thinking that I was in, at least in part complicit with with his ordering a bombing and some, some child gets killed somewhere in the Middle East, for example, it's just a little too much for me to take. So, um, you know, you can call, call that a cop out if you will, uh, but I, I don't plan on voting next week. Well, I'm with George Carlin myself on voting. Uh, if it, you just need to watch the George Carlin video on YouTube on voting to get that opinion. Uh, now, speaking of the Middle East, the US does seem to be fighting some kind of semi-secret proxy war with Russia uh, in Syria at the moment, which is very confusing and the mass media just doesn't kind of get into it very well. Uh, do you think Trump might stop this kind of um, proxy war if he got in? Well, I hope he would. It's it's really an absurdity. It's It's so... <laughs> If it weren't so serious, it would be hilarious to see the left suddenly worried about the evil Russians. Thanks. Uh, but more importantly is this neoconservative grip on both parties in the U.S. And they're, they're abandoning Trump and going to Hillary now. And they're absolutely enamored of resuscitating this non-existent Cold War. Russia is no threat to anyone. If you look at if you look at the size and scope of Russia's territory, this is a country of 145 million people. They are shrinking. Their territory is getting smaller, not expanding. Asian and Middle Eastern forces are going to increasingly move into what is currently Russia and, and change its borders and change its culture and change its, its ethnic makeup, its religious makeup, its linguistic makeup. 145 million Russians are shrinking. This is not a, a growing imperialistic threat. It is no threat to the NATO countries. It's no threat to America. And it just shows you the degree of desperation uh, among uh, these these endless uh, military interventionists. I mean, even the war on terror is not enough for them. Like, apparently, it's not hot enough for them or steady enough for them. We need another boogeyman. We need to resurrect Russia. And Putin is a convenient scapegoat. So it's, it's um, again, it would be funny if it weren't so dire. But uh, Hillary's insane if she thinks that uh, Americans want her to be engaging us in potentially a serious conflict with Russia over Syria. Most Americans don't care about Syria. They don't realize that we're responsible in large part for for cracking the egg that is now Syria, and, and we're responsible for, for creating these refugees in large part. Um, th th you know, this is not what Americans are dwelling on in this election. So if she does win and if she does intensify um, our engagement in with a no-fly zone or whatever it might be in Syria, this will be something that she's doing at the behest of, uh, of her foreign policy advisors and at the behest of some people who back her. It won't be at the behest of the U.S. people who, sad to say, are pretty indifferent. Now, a lot of um, economic problems in the past, such as the 1930s and so on, have been covered up by a major war. And some people think that maybe a war is being instituted to to kind of cover up the huge crisis uh, since 2007. Now, if Hillary does win, there seems to be a pause in economics at the moment with everyone waiting for this election result. Uh, what do you think is going to happen to the economics of the United States if, if Hillary wins the election? 
Well, she's going to wish she hadn't would be my prediction because what we do know is that she'll keep Janet Yellen. So Fed policy will remain the same. And by Fed policy, I mean basically sticking your head in the sand and kicking the can down the road three months, six months at a time while we all sit around and wait breathlessly for these latest pronouncements of whether Yellen and the FOMC are going to raise interest rates a quarter point <laughs> or some, some ridiculous amount, like the world hangs in the balance of a quarter point interest rate amongst commercial banks overnight. Um, so I think with Hillary, you will get a head in the sand, hit and hope mentality. Uh, there, it, It'll be a continuation of the Obama uh, fiscal and monetary policy, which is basically, let's ride this out. Let's continue to inflate the dollar as needed. Let's continue to keep interest rates as low as needed. Let's continue to resuscitate the patient and hope that somehow uh, the U.S. economy and the West's economy come roaring back to life despite these depredations. This has been the policy since 08. We keep waiting and waiting and waiting for this real economic growth to come, uh, real increases in GDP, uh, real real uh, organic growth amongst companies, not this financialization where the share price is going up through buybacks and other financial mechanisms, but the underlying productivity of the company, it's not finding emerging markets or new, new customers or you know, great new products. Um, that's not happening. So we've got this kind of phony growth uh, among equity prices and share value, but we don't have any real organic growth ha- happening you know, deep down at the company level in terms of capital expenditures or, or productivity. So I think uh, Hillary will inherit a very tough situation how much longer we can keep the dollar uh, propped up. It could be a long, long time because currencies are relative. And as long as the currency is better in a certain sense than the euro, uh, as long as it's more widely used than the Swiss franc, as long as uh, the, the Japanese keep doing what they're doing, as long as the Chinese keep doing what they're doing, the dollar will continue to look like the freshest cert in the laundry. So in that sense, she might buy herself some time. But, uh, you know, can we take four more years of, of QE, or alternatively, will raising interest rates and ending QE put the economy into a tailspin that Hillary wouldn't accept politically and would you know go direct Yellen to, to halt? Uh, boy, the, the, the idea that that won't happen in the next four years seems awfully remote to me. Yeah, it's kind of a Doug Casey's eye of the hurricane, isn't it? Now, just to be even-handed, uh, some have predicted that if Trump does win, his first act as president uh, in January will be to sack Janet Yellen. Uh, but just before that, just to kind of spite him and using her kind of Keynesian thinking, she will increase interest rates deliberately to cause a problem. Now, do you think that this uh, raising of interest rates to a more natural level, whatever the market decides the natural level would be, is actually something that should be done to sort of take the pain now that's built up over the last 20 years and then to grow the US economy and then hopefully the global economy in two or three years time when the huge recession that that will probably cause is then worked through and then all the malinvestments are cleared out. Well, absolutely. I think that's something that should be done. I think it's something that has to be done. The recession is the is the cure. It's, it's not the problem to be solved. It's the cure to the problem to be solved. And that involves some pain for a few years. And that's why it's politically a dead end. No, no politician wants to run on a platform of saying, vote for me, <laughs> and I'm going to rip the Band-Aid off, and every, repl- unemployment's going to spike, and uh, there's going to be massive layoffs. But you know what? We'll be setting the stage for some real economic growth three to five years down the road. <laughs> uh, not a winning platform. And, and that's, that goes to Hoppe's point, that this is what democracy creates. It creates high time preference, even amongst voters in the political class, where we just want everything now for free. And we want to pay for everything somewhere down the road, hopefully after we're dead, or for politicians after they've gotten the votes and they're out of office. Um, this, this is a this is a feature, not a bug of democracy. It's one of the great uh, uh, problems with democracy, and it's especially acute in a multicultural welfare state like the U.S., where you've got so many competing interests and so many ugly social divisions. People don't even have the sort of unity of of goals. Uh, that they once had in a small homogenous country like Nor- Norway, for instance. Um, so it, it's 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 very very tough, and I think that uh, uh, you know I don't care what the Fed does in a sense because I don't think the Fed ought to be in the business of providing money and or setting interest rates. But you know we're not for the time being for the for the very near future. 
anyway, we're going to continue to have central banks, and uh, they're going to continue to control our currency. So the, the, the least bad thing the Fed could do would be, yes, to allow interest rates to rise and to start getting back to an economy that is actually based on saving and capital accumulation instead of consumption and debt. Uh, this is you know, the, this is how history, this is how human history has evolved. People uh, consumed less than they made and they put money away for a rainy day, whether that's for their family and kids or whether that's in a corporate environment. Um, the fact that we've upended that uh, forever and ever, if you listen, if you talk to uh, uh, a Larry Summers or even a Ben Bernanke, who now says we shouldn't even unwind the QE purchases that the Fed has made since 08, um, you know, that's more than just technical monetary uh, policy uh, mechanisms at work. That's an actual ideological sea change um, in in how we live our lives as humans, whether we want to consume or whether we want to save. It's a it's an existential question, not just a technical question. Now we are seeing these uh, kind of ideological things changing around the world. We we saw Brexit a few months ago in the UK, and tr with the rise of Trump is um, being uh, said to be the, a, a part of the the Brexit kind of global movement. Trump has a huge ego. Do you think he could actually be a politician who isn't affected by politics and who could actually let natural interest rates come back into the marketplace? Yeah, it's an interesting question, isn't it? Uh, he, I think he does have a deep-seated psychological need to be liked or loved or admired. I guess that's universal, but in him, it seems amped up a, hun a hundredfold. <laughs> the question would be whether he wants to be loved and liked and admired by the political donor class and his political consultants, or whether he wants to be loved, liked, and admired by the American people. Two different things. Um, but at this point, we're so far beyond any sort of political consensus in this country, that this myth of democratic consensus is going to be laid bare. And if Trump wins, the left is going to be apoplectic. Um, we're going to have a period of, of division, uh, probably like we've never seen before. There are going to be some, some, some very deep-rooted interests that, uh, ha that don't want to see Donald Trump uh, as a healing force <laughs> in American <laughs> politics. They want to see quite the opposite if they don't get what they want, which is at this point, I guess, Hillary. Uh, so, boy, I, will, will Trump be able to uh, to do the right thing? Very, very unlikely. He's going to be pressured from all sides. And uh, th this is a guy that, um, you know, we, we don't know. We don't know how he would respond to that kind of pressure. Uh, we know how Hillary would. And I think that's that's what people who like Trump argue in the U.S. At least with Trump, we don't know. With Hillary, we know. Wouldn't it be nice if he appointed Ron Paul to be his uh, financial advisor? Now, we've seen uh, all these banks around the world, the Japanese banks, the U.K. banks, the European banks, the U.S. banks, all printing money, buying their own debt from their own governments that own them. Um, the traditional barometer on this has been gold. And we have seen a rise in the gold price over the last few months, but it's paused for a little while waiting for this US election, probably. Uh, do you think gold could be the canary in the coal mine, which starts to signal the end of this endless Keynesian quantitative easing um, immediately after the US election, let's say if Hillary wins? Well, it certainly could be. Uh, gold goes up and down for some mysterious reasons sometime, but gold never goes to zero. That much we know. So I don't consider gold an investment. I consider it a form of, of money, a base form of money. So really, when you're buying gold, you're engaged in Forex in a certain sense. You're, you're saying to yourself that I think gold is going to go up relative to other currencies, not that it has, not that it's going to go up in, like an investment goes up. It's not an investment. It's money. Um, the, the, the thing holding gold back, ultimately, is the fact that in most Western countries, it's not used as legal tender. Uh, which it could be very easily uh, be used as such. We could come up with electronic gold where you have a, a store of physical gold somewhere in an account and then you simply use a debit card that can, that can uh, cre you know, shave off tiny fractions of it. So we don't have any problems with actually handling physical gold at a cash register or point of sale. Um, and the fact that this is illegal... You can't, you can't, you basically can't do business in the U.S. or, or remit taxes in the U.S. using gold. That's considered a form of barter or a capital gain or a capital loss transaction. Um, the fact that it's effectively banned um, skews the gold market. Uh, it skews its value as a currency. 
Uh, I, I don't think gold is going to go to $5,000 or $10,000 because uh, there's another looming crisis. Um, I think if it was going to do that, it would have done that in 2008. But I do think gold will will very soon be at $2,000. I don't think that's a stretch. And uh, I, you know, I'll just say this. There, there's never been a time in, in history where grandpa died with a bunch of physical gold and left it to his grandkids and, and everyone was, was sad about it. It's always been a good thing. It's always been happy. But there's been plenty of times when grandpa died with a bunch of worthless stock certificates in an old musty drawer somewhere for a company that doesn't exist anymore. So I'll, I'll just say that. Okay. Now, getting away from the uh, the Republicans and Democrats, because we spent a long time on them, um, let's have a look at the Libertarians. Now, Gary Johnson is a candidate in this election, uh, and he's been a big disappointment to a lot of people. Uh, would you have preferred to see somebody like John McAfee to kind of disrupt things and shake things up? Or um, is Gary Johnson just fighting a, an impossible battle? No, I would definitely rather have seen a more engaging candidate, someone who is really going to the, to shake things up and to uh, ask the hard questions and to campaign vigorously and also to campaign honestly and to, to talk about libertarianism as an ideology and as a, as a political theory. Uh, and, and give it a little bit of intellectual heft and weight and not just try to be a retail politician because by by trying to divorce libertarianism of any ideological or intellectual basis and just having this kind of hippy-dippy approach which says, well, we're low-tax liberals, we like social inclusion, and you know we just think liberty works better. Well, that – frankly, that has worked far less than having Ron Paul give a purist message. I mean, the Ron Paul campaign was a much bigger deal than the Gary Johnson campaign, even though Gary Johnson's had the advantage of, of four more years of, you know, the, the huge social media environment and all these other ways. He's had a lot of media exposure, but he just hasn't captured anyone's imagination uh, because he says unimaginative things. Uh, so I, I don't understand uh, what he's doing. Um, I don't really understand his motivations. I, he doesn't seem to be self motivated, is self-interested. He seems like a, a nice enough guy. I, I wouldn't say he's using the LP as some sort of platform for his own benefit. If he is, he's doing a very poor job of it. Uh, but, uh, you know, for your listeners in the UK, it, it's really been a sideshow at most. And, and Gary Johnson 2016 is not, does not have the feel here of a revolution like Ron Paul 2012 did, not at all. Yeah, that was a fabulous campaign. I still remember the blimp in, uh, in an <laughs> earlier year, which was brilliant. Now, you you were heavily associated with Ron Paul, doing a lot of work with him and for him. Um, short of cloning him in, in a singularity, um, are there any future kind of Ron Pauls on the horizon out there? Well, I wouldn't clone Ron because he'll, he'll tell you himself that he's not the greatest public speaker. But part of that was also – a. There was an upside to that because people always knew his responses weren't canned. They weren't polished. They weren't tested like Mitt Romney. It sounded like everything that came out of his mouth was his actual honest thought. So, so his lack of polish was balanced by sort of a homespun uh, likability. It's interesting, the Rand Paul phenomenon, uh, Rand didn't get the traction he thought he was going to get, and he had to ultimately go home and work to make sure he wins his Kentucky Senate seat. Um, we have to sort of step back and ask ourselves, look, the Republicans have had three chances to vote for a libertarian Republican. They had 28 with Ron and, and John McCain. They had 2012 with Ron Paul and Mitt Romney. And they had 2016 with Rand Paul and a slate of other candidates. And in all three instances, they declined. So at some point, they, they declined overwhelmingly. So at some point, we have to say there is no libertarian wing of the GOP. There's no working within the party uh, to to get it uh, to be more libertarian. There's been some mild success with that at the state and local level. But at the national level, this is not a libertarian Republican Party. This is a statist, corporatist, militarist, uh, globalist Republican Party. So if the Republicans go away or s cease to be a force on the national scene, I, I say good riddance. They're not doing anything. They're not conserving anything. They're certainly not the party of liberty and capitalism and markets and opportunity. <laughs> no, no one could, would, would say that about them. So um, having – we ought to just treat the Republican Party as sort of a wing of the Democratic Party and get on with it. Is there another – Ron Paul in the wings. I think Rand is very seriously considering running in 2020. 
and, and there are some other good younger people in Congress like Justin Amash. Um, but uh, boy, you know, it just seems like if by now a libertarian was going to get some traction within the two-party system, they would have gotten it, and, and they haven't. So uh, I, I think we should uh, roll up our sleeves, not put our faith in uh, white knights, but rather just look in the mirror and say, whatever, whatever we're going to do, we're going to do it ourselves. Subscribe to Mises Weekends via iTunes U, Stitcher, and SoundCloud, or listen on Mises.org and YouTube.